Hello, I'm Lynn Davis, Program Manager for Healthy Democracy, and welcome to the live Eugene Review Panel Selection Event, Take Two. If you tuned in at our planned time on Friday, you'll already know that we ran into some technical issues and found ourselves forced to reschedule. What can I say? 2020 clearly still has some tricks up its sleeve for us. But neither technology nor anything else will hold us back. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're doing here today. And then we'll hear from the mayor of Eugene, Lucy Vinnis. Then I'll have a brief conversation about the project with Terry Harding, principal planner for the city of Eugene. And then we'll carry out the official lottery. So what's happening here today? Well, this is the official start of a really exciting new kind of democratic process. Review panels are based on the idea that everyday folks randomly selected from the general public should be involved in decision making in a democracy. This dates all the way back to ancient Greece, and it was the inspiration as a republic was being formed behind the idea of jury service in criminal trials, a jury of one peers, one's peers rather, hearing evidence and working together to determine how a case should be decided. Now, in recent decades, there's been renewed interest in this kind of thinking and thinking about how randomly selected folks could be involved in other kinds of decisions as well, to bring new voices into our public decision making and to try to reflect better the many different kinds of folks who live in our cities. Now, in a country of millions of people or even a city of 150,000, we can't all be involved in every decision. That's completely impractical. And that's why we elect representatives, mayors, city councilors, and so forth. But as any high school civics teacher would say, elections are only the start. We, the people of this republic, have a responsibility to be involved in our governance in other ways too. There are lots of ways to be involved. Apply for one of the city's many public committees, attend your local neighborhood association, join another kind of civic or political organization. Or if you ever see a letter in the mail inviting you to be part of a lottery selected process like this one, please reply. And in fact, when we sent out 7,500 letters to randomly selected addresses across Eugene, quite a high number of you did reply. In fact, as high a rate as we've ever received for a project anywhere. So well done, Eugene. You've really stepped up. I've told you a bit about the process, and we're going to talk more about what a democratic lottery is, how it works, and what the panel will be working on together here in a moment when I speak to Terry Harding. But first, I need to introduce who we are. Um, Healthy Democracy is a nonpartisan nonprofit that designs and coordinates innovative, deliberative democracy programs. And the thing I'd really like you to know about us is we're here for one purpose and one purpose only, helping to coordinate a credible process where panelists on the review panel are free and able to work together to make their recommendations to the city. We have never taken any political position on any political issue. We don't take money from potentially political sources, and we don't intend to start doing either of those things anytime soon. If there's one thing this process is not, in fact, it's sort of a traditional focus group. That's not what it is. We, the staff, uh, in, in that kind of process would gather up the information and interpret it for the city. But that's not what's going to happen here. There will be no interpretation. The panelists selected here today will write every single word that they want the city to hear. All right. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, I'd like to introduce you to the mayor of Eugene, Lucy Vinnis. Uh, then I'll be back in a moment to discuss a few more of the details of this process, and then we'll do the actual selection of the panel. Mayor Vinnis, welcome to the selection event. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us today in this first ever uh, you're in the vanguard just by sending in your application and expressing your willingness to participate in this review panel. We are breaking new ground here and it speaks volumes of all of you that uh, you are here joining us today. It makes me proud of our community, which is always nimble and innovative and people are ready to try something new. House Bill 2001 is a very important piece of legislation. It's legacy work that will have an impact on our community for many years to come. One of the things we struggle with as a city is being sure that we're hearing from a diversity of voices. And this is our new way, this collaboration with Healthy Democracy, to find a better way to, to broaden the spectrum of people that we hear from so that we have a good sense of where we're going as a community on critical issues. Your willingness to step up for 35 hours of meetings on a wonky 
land use kind of question. It just makes me proud. I am grateful to you for your willingness to do this work. You make our community strong by being here, by your uh, perseverance and willingness to understand this topic. Thank you very much and good luck to all of you. Mayor Venice, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And thank you to the city for taking this step with us to design a new kind of democratic process, bringing new folks into the conversation and providing useful advice to city staff on a very important issue. And to take a deeper dive into that issue and the review panel process, I'd like to welcome Terry Harding, Principal Planner for the City of Eugene. Terry, welcome to the selection event. Thank you. So happy to be here. Wonderful to have you here. Thanks for taking time on a Sunday to do this with us. Now, as I mentioned in my intro, we're the process people, and we design our processes to be issue neutral. So this process should be the same for every public policy topic of this type, of this level of complexity. So we don't care at all what the actual issue is, but I expect there are probably people watching this video that do care a lot about what the issue is. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the topic the panel will be working on. Absolutely. So we are asking the panel to take a look at the City of Eugene's implementation of a new state law. And it's referred to as House Bill 2001. It was passed in the legislative session in the summer of 2019. And basically it is requiring cities across Oregon to allow more types of housing in more places. And so we've had a, a history of dividing the city up by zones and large parts of Eugene and many other cities right now are only available for single family detached housing. This bill changes that and it requires us to really allow um, what's called middle housing. So duplexes, triplexes, cottage clusters and row houses um, and quadplexes, those kinds of housing across um, much bigger parts of communities like Eugene. Thanks for that introduction. And could you be a little bit specific about what kind of advice the panel will be offering to the city? What, what exactly they're going to be tasked to do? Sure. So we're going to be asking this panel to give us their insights and their talk about their lived experience with housing in the city of Eugene, and then express their concerns and hopes about uh, planning for more housing in more places, and then finally give us some insight into guiding principles that should guide the technical work as we do it. And then when they come back in the spring, the panelists will actually weigh in on our draft code and policy products and give us, our, give us feedback about how well um, the draft products actually meet up with those established principles. Yeah, from our perspective, that's a really unique quality of this event is that is that sort of that what we call feedback loops in, in technical jargon. And there's two of them essentially where the panel produces principles and then comes back uh, later and reviews the actual sort of legalese of the code and, and then provides opinions again. Um, so that's really unique and, uh, and, and we're really sort of excited about that possibility in one of these processes. Um, I wanted to ask you where this review panel fits into the city's overall public engagement plan on this topic. Great question. So this panel is a new way of doing things, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it is only one way that we're interacting with the public. So when we make public policy or amend our code, um, there are a series of things we're both required to do and we do as a matter of practice within the city of Eugene. So we have a number of other panels, including a boards and commissions panel, a local partners group, and an equity roundtable that will also be doing work this fall on the same questions that I just talked about, and feeding all of that into the project structure. So they're a piece, a very important piece, an innovative piece, but um, just one way for folks to get in. Right, fantastic. Um, and, and you talked about it being a unique sort of process or a first time. What is unique about this process from the city's perspective? Yeah, well, the lottery selected panel is, um, is really unique and the reason that we started talking with you all at Healthy Democracy over two years ago now. So that's been something we've been watching and uh, watched you do your process with the city of Milwaukee. 
um, on their policy issue and just really impressed with the mechanism that you have, the sortation process that we're going to watch later um, that kind of combs through randomly selected, but then balanced um, categories of demographics is just a really exciting thing. So I would say the lottery selection method of reaching a, a broader representative pool of people is a really new and exciting piece. Um, and then removing barriers to participation is another big one. And the piece that I think really does that in a big way is that you're compensating the panelists. You're paying them for their time. And that removes a huge barrier for people who are busy, um, maybe don't have time or resources to participate in a project like this. It's going to take a fair amount of time. Yeah, true. And um, if anyone's wondering, you're welcome to see there's a lot of information on exactly what the compensation is and all that stuff at the project website on our website, healthydemocracy.org slash Eugene. Um, but it, about a little over $16 an hour, I think, is what folks will be paid. Um, $560 total, if I'm remembering that number right. And, uh, and also, the, because this is an all online sort of event, um, we know that folks won't be you know, sort of don't have equal access to technology. Um, and uh, so we'll definitely be sending out some, some loaner laptops, even hotspots and webcams and all that kind of stuff as needed. Um, so don't worry if you've uh, uh, responded to the mailing and you don't have access to a computer, we've got you covered. Um, Terry, before we dig into the demographics of who responded and talk a little bit more about that sort of demographic balance, anything else you'd like to add I don't think so. I'm just really excited to find out who our panelists are going to be. Fantastic. All right, that's great. Well, I'm going to pull up here the, um, the sort of chart of uh, what the percentages are in the general population compared to what the percentages are among all of those who replied. And we'll sort of talk through each of those categories actually a little bit. Um, this will all be online right after this event. Um, so you can take a look at, uh, at the details. You don't have to follow it all on screen here. Um, but uh, yeah, let's, let's look at the, go down the list here and look at it a bit. So the first category we're going to look at here is age, age range specifically. Uh, we use fairly standard categories across all of our programs um, to, as one of many ways to try to remove um, kind of biases, potential biases on our part. Um, but uh, yeah, so these are fairly standard categories. Uh, the city decided to start at age 16. Residents 16 and up uh, were uh, eligible to reply. And um, you can see here, because Eugene is a college town, there's quite a few folks in the 16 to 24 range. 29.3%, um, in fact, according to um, these are census estimates from 2019. Um, so if we were. That's, so that's in column B here. Now, if we were taking the, um, just a raw target, the, act, the absolute number that we really wished we could get um, out of 30 panelists total, we would have nine, uh, uh, nine panelists selected there. That's just a simple multiplication of the percentage in the general population times 30. That's it, and we'd get nine. But you'll see there's another column uh, right next to it that has a range and is bolded. And that's because we can't just take an, an absolute number because as you're about to see, there's quite a bunch of categories here. So we can't, uh, we can't guarantee an absolute perfect match, excuse me, across all categories. So we, we make a range here, one below, one above. Um, and and the, only, the only sort of exception to that is where we have a target that is less than, that is two people or less, uh, would be, you know, if we, just, if we just had the percentages multiplied out. And I'll show you an example of that really fast. If I scroll down here to race and ethnicity, for example. Um, if, if, we do, if we just multiply the percentage in the population of folks who identify as Asian or Pacific Islander times 30, well, we would have one person on the panel. 
And we have a policy that, uh, that we will, uh, we set a minimum bar of two people for any demographic category. So that's another reason why the demographic categories need to be fairly constant across different programs so that we're not sort of cherry picking, uh, you know, what categories there might be uh, in order to sort of take, adva it's, you know, take advantage of, a, of that kind of minimum. Uh, but no, these are standard standard categories, and um, and I hope folks will will appreciate that. Uh, they're sort of the standard categories that we use in the U.S. in general. The census, of course, has many more categories for for race, for example. But uh, but they've sort of been combined down into these categories uh, here. So other than that, uh, sort of stipulation, all the other ranges are just a simple math. Um, it's, it's one up and one down, one below, one above. Um, and when this is posted online, you can actually look at the formulas for yourself. Um, so uh, I want to just really quickly, before we go through the rest of the categories, walk through the, the table here. So this uh, fourth column here, fifth column here rather, shows the number of folks who responded to the mailing. In this case, 16 to 24. 20 folks responded to the mailing. So ideally, we're picking nine. Really, we're going to pick between eight and 10 to give a little bit of leeway to the software to do its job, um, since it's picking across so many different categories. And we have 20 to choose from in that category. Now, this uh, sixth column here is, uh, shows the, the percentage of, out of all respondents. So this is just going to give us a little bit of an idea of um, who responded versus who actually lives in the city of Eugene. And this is really interesting for us um, and, and, and sort of um, you know, comparing uh, the lottery selection kind of process to the ways that other people, that, that people are often involved. Um, because uh, one thing, as you mentioned, that's unique about this is that it's not just random, but demographically reflective of the city or in this case, the city and its, and its urban growth boundary. Um, and, and one reason for that is that folks tend to respond at very different rates than, than they exist in the general population. Um, so uh, folks between 16 and 24 make up a little over 29% of the general population, but they're only 8% of the folks who responded to this mailing. Um, so uh, we're not going to we're not going to look at the rest. Of the next two categories here are related to um, alternates. So we're going to select this panel of alternates, and uh, that that panel is is calculated uh, via a formula as well. And then there's zeros in these final columns because well that's the panel and the alternates we're going to select. So those will be put in there after the event today. So let's just walk through. So I should say, Terry, any any questions or comments about that sort of whirlwind explanation? You may be getting this, but um, I'm just happy to see kind of the distribution of respondents by council award, and then um, happy to talk a little bit about the school age demographics um, for those categories that we're going to use school age data. Right, that's a good point. We should talk about sources here. Um, yeah, let's do that first, actually. So a number of the sources here are from the census. Uh, 2019 ACS estimates for any census nerds out there. Um, and that's true for age, for, uh, well, council ward is, uh, by definition, the council wards actually have the same, the same population or very close. And, um, and interestingly, those folks who are not in the city proper but are in the urban growth boundary make up actually sort of out of the total all, very close to a, a ninth council ward, essentially, in terms of population, just slightly less than the population of the other wards. So, and in terms of, you know, when we take it... I, I did want to um, point that out because the city of Eugene's UTB does have a fair amount of uh, residents who live outside city limits, and we want to make sure that people know that they're included in this lottery. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really important. And I know there were one or two people that contacted us, um, and thank you, by the way, to everyone who contacted us with questions, and feel free to keep doing so, um, who asked, oh, I'm not in the city proper. Can I still participate? And yes, absolutely. So this was taken, the, those 7,500 names were random from across the city's urban growth boundary, not just the city proper. So uh, let's go back up and, and just look down these numbers a little bit and see if there's anything sort of interesting to note here. I've, no, I've noted that the, the age 
um, is uh, young people responded at a much lower rate than they exist in the general population. And even of the category a little bit above that, 25 to 34, it's also just a little bit lower than, than in the general population. In, in my age category, the next one, uh, it's almost exactly what, what it is in the general population. Um, and then after that, we get numbers that are quite a bit higher in some cases uh, than the general population. Here, folks who are 55 to 64 responded at a, almost 19%. Um, but are actually only 6% in the general population. So this is sort of going to help balance, uh, balance for that. And that is very typical to, to what we see actually here, um, that uh, sort of uh, folks of, uh, in their 30s to, and, and folks who are, who are much older, 75 or more, tend to respond at, at rates that are similar to what's in the general population. Folks who are younger tend to respond less, and folks who are sort of middle-aged tend to respond more. Um, that's just our experience here in Oregon, but it's different in different places, interestingly, when we talk to our partners overseas. Um, in terms of Council Ward here, you'll see there's, there's some big differences. Uh, council Ward 1 responded at a much higher rate than in, its, in the general population. Um, same thing here with Council Ward 5, looks like. And Council Ward 6 and 8 uh, responded at, at somewhat lower, quite a bit lower than, than in the general population. Um, and... Uh, so, so yeah, uh, disability, yes or no, quite similar. Renter or homeowner status, very similar to the general population. Um, very similar. And, and that's actually, that's fairly surprising. Um, usually renters respond at a lower rate than in the general population. Um, gender is actually closer than it normally is. Uh, usually women respond at much higher rates than men. In this case, they respond at higher rates for sure. 56% uh, versus 51% in the general population, um, and men 42% versus 49% in the general population. So, but it's it's not it's not as off as it sometimes is. And 2.5% of folks who identified with another gender identity. Uh, now, race and ethnicity um, is another one where it's often uh, it's often fairly fairly different. So, in this case. Um, Asian and Pacific Islander, folks who identify that way, responded about 2.9% versus 3.8% in the general population. Those numbers are fairly low uh, in total, so it's, it's hard to sort of make a, a comparison. But they're, they're relatively close, actually, in, in, in terms of, of what it normally is. Black and African American, almost the same as in the general population. But again, those, those hard numbers are very, are very low. So sort of in, in um, statistics talk, the sample size here is quite low. We shouldn't make too many. Uh, too many comparisons based on based on those numbers. Uh, one number that's a little bit larger, uh, so we can make you know m maybe make more inferences here. Uh, Hispanic or Latino folks uh, uh, of any race, and and now the racial categories here are sort of combined race and ethnicity together. So these other categories are Asian or Pacific Islander, non-Hispanic, and Black or African American, non-Hispanic, etc. Or and and folks of any race who identified as Hispanic or Latino or Latino. Uh, responded at uh, a little under 5% um, versus 17% in the general population. Um, also lower for folks who identify as multiracial, 5% versus 9.5% uh, in, the, in the general population. Folks who identify as Native American, um, actually a little bit higher than in the general population. And folks who identify as white, quite a bit higher than in the general population in terms of response rates. And then our final category here, is uh, just to be totally thorough, <laughs> as we're being, is um, educational attainment. And there's four different sort of categories here. These are based on what the census uh, measures. Um, and, um, and it is actually, uh, actually a little bit better than we might have expected in terms of matching up respondents with, respondent rate with, with uh, rate in the general population. So 2% of the respondents um, identified as having some schooling but no n diploma versus almost 7% in the general population. And as you go through the categories, all three of, of these first categories are lower than in the general population. And folks who have a bachelor's degree or higher uh, responded at almost 60% response rate versus 36% in the general population. So that's quite a, big, quite a big difference. So that sort of gives us an idea of if this were just pure randomness without any sort of demographic balancing, we would get a, a, a sort of a, 
a room of, of panelists that didn't look like the city um, in a number of different ways. So this is that sort of attempt to, to balance that out a little bit and truly create a sort of microcosm of the city in one room. Um, any thoughts or questions on any of that stuff? Terry? It's all super fascinating. Uh, I think the only comment I would have at this point is to acknowledge that our racial and ethnic makeup is a uh, reflection of our state's history of exclusion, and that directly relates to the law that we're implementing. House Bill 2001 is attempting to undo the exclusionary policy and zoning that our state has as a part of its history. And so we are moving towards much more representative um, representation on this panel than we've had in the past, but we're taking another step. I mentioned the equity roundtable earlier, and that is a group that's going to be made up of specific uh, categories of folks that come from communities and organizations that, um, that do equity-based work. And so they will also be compensated for that time. And I just wanted those watching to know that um, is also part of our process. Yeah, that's an important note. Another part of a sort of another part of the public engagement plan, which has a number of these different pieces. Um, that's fantastic. So um, I think that's that's all the detail, and probably somewhat more than than folks expected. Let's move to the selection. Are you ready to go? I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Here we go. Here we go. So I'm going to move over to the selection software here. I've preloaded it with the, the categories. Um, this is the data that you've just seen in terms of, and you'll see it again actually when it runs, in terms of the, the targets or the target ranges in each of the demographic categories. And then also with the list of respondents. And you'll see here it's listing seven categories, which is correct. That's good. And it's also listing 239 people in the respondent pool, which is good because that's what we had. Um, and out of that, uh, we are selecting 30 people. I should mention here real fast before I run this and show the results that if you were a prospective panelist and a respondent, if you returned the, the mailing or uh, uh, responded online, and you still have your letter that has your ID code on it, get that ready because you'll be able in a moment to see whether you were selected for the panel in real time. Don't worry. Your name, address, no contact information or anything will be shown. Just that code, which only you know, and us, obviously. And, uh, but you'll be able to see in real time whether you were selected. Um, the only exception to that may be if multiple people were uh, replied from the same household. And in that case, you'll be able to see, well, you may be able to see from the demographics who, uh, who from your household was selected. Um, but you'll be able to see later on. And then, of course, we'll contact you by email right after this, uh, this event or, or later today, I should say. So um, yeah, with that, uh, and I should actually one more thing. So, so we invited anybody to reply who, who lived at the household that received the, the mailing, that 7,500 person mailing. Um, and multiple people could reply in some cases. Two, three, four different people replied from the same household, which is fantastic. But we want the panel to be a diverse representation, of course. Um, and so we're not going to select anybody that lives, we're not going to select two people that live at the same household. Um, so after we do the selection here, Terry, you and I are going to look um, at the resulting document and, um, and see whether there's anybody that, that has sort of responded, uh, whether there's two people from the same household on the list. And we'll be able to see that by the codes matching up. So we're going to do that. And if that does happen, which it can, it's all random here, uh, then we'll just rerun the selection process again until we, until we get a panel that doesn't have that. And I've run it enough times to know that, that we will be able to get a panel where there's not two people from the same household. But it might take us a time or two. Um, all right. I think enough explanation. Let's hit the button here. Um, and yeah, I just I'm going to hit this button, run selection, and it's going to select 30 panelists as I put in here. So here we go. Three, two, one, run. Fantastic. All right. So we're going to look down in this this kind of uh, it, it looks kind of technical here, but it's just showing the the kind of ranges of the selection under the want category. That's how much we're looking for. How many folks we're looking for. Um, in uh, you know between those ranges, as I mentioned before, and then it it tried, 
It tried once, actually. It did it on the first time. That's how good the sample was. <laughs> That's how many people responded. Usually, it takes a number of times to get to a successful result. But um, it essentially you know, it goes through, and it, it's totally brute force. It you know, tries to select a panel at random, goes through each category, and makes sure that, it, you know, that each category is satisfied. And it spits out a result. And usually, it spits out a result that fails. And so it does it again, and, and again, and again, a number of times. Sometimes it takes 30, 40, 50, 100 times for it to get to a panel that's selected. In this case, because we're only selecting 30 people out of 239, it had a lot to work with, and it selected on the first try. So that's fantastic. Now let's go and look at the, um, at the folks who were selected. Just downloaded the selected document there. And um, I'm going to make this a little bit larger so we can see it on screen. So what we're looking for here is, not quite that large, um, yeah, is in this, under this code column, I'm wondering if you and I could look for just a second. If you're able to see that on screen, Terry, can you see that all right? Yep, I can see it. OK, perfect. So what we're looking for here are the numbers that have a dash after them. Dash 1 or dash 2 or dash 3 means that there were one or two or three. They're, they're within that certain household. There were, there were multiple people. So what we're looking for here is any duplicate numbers that have a, a hyphen after them. And let's just take a minute to look through here. And I do see one, 8499. Nine. There were two people selected from that household. So let's put this away and go back and close the selection software. We'll We're going to run back. the whole thing again. And run it all again. Absolutely. Wow. New panel. <laughs> um, and believe it or not, uh, yeah, as I maybe mentioned before, we used to do this by hand. And we had a sort of an independent commission that would be gathered to, and that we'd anonymize all the data, including the category headings and all the other data. And then they would they would come and they would do it by hand using this super laborious kind of system. Because you you know, we have to match all these different categories. So thank goodness it's just a computer program now. But occasionally we have to run it multiple times. So we're going to select the categories again. And we're going to select all respondents. That's who we're selecting. Yep, we're looking at the right numbers there. Again, we're selecting 30 total people. Let me make it show the log. Let's run the selection again. Fantastic. I didn't count down that time. Oh, it had a success in the first trial. Let's see if this panel has any duplicates. All right. Now you can see there's different, different folks here. There's only one person from that 8499 household this time. Are there, oh, yeah. 46212. There is one. There's another one. All right. There's three. From their household. They really <laughs> want to participate. We'll try it again. All right. OK. Let's pull up the categories one more time here. And the total number of respondents. All right. And we'll do it again. Ta-da. Yep. Oh, here it took it till the third try. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> So let's download that document and open it up again. All right. Any duplicates in this one? I think it's looking good to me. You see any? Do you see any duplicate numbers there? Small screen, so. Yeah, sure. We're looking only at the at the hyphenated numbers. So we have four seven five two eight four nine nine four zero three four one four six two one two six four three nine two six five eight 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 and seven zero four eight five. I think I think we're good. Awesome. Perfect, unless you see anything that I'm not seeing there. But I think we're, I think we're looking at a panel that has uh, only one person from any particular household. As you notice, there's a, a number of folks that responded to this mailing, actually more than in the past, who uh, were from the same household.
which is which is cool. Uh, and in fact, we even got calls from folks who, you know, were maybe neighbors of somebody that got a mailing and asked, "Oh, can I reply?" And we had to unfortunately say, "No, I'm sorry, you weren't in the original 7500 who got the mail." That's sort of the first random selection. So, um, so sorry. Uh, but I heard it too. There was a Facebook comment that was like, "I never get people to the post." <laughs> I know. I don't think I've won something at a lottery since I was about 14 years old. And I won a digital camera, though. So I think I'm still sort of making up for the fact that I, <laughs> I won big way back then. Um, but congratulations to everybody who, who sees your number on screen here. We'll put this up on the website as well. And you'll be able to get a, uh, you'll be able you'll be getting an email from us personally um, or from my colleague, Kelly Coates, who's our operations manager, uh, who you've talked to before. Um, and now, in the meantime, let me go back to the selection software. I'm going to close out of this. And we'll go back here, and I'm going to download the remaining panelists. So this is the 209, uh, sorry, not panelists, 209 respondents who were not just selected in this process. All right, and now that I've downloaded that, I'm going to close out of the program here. We're going to go back into it again. And this time we're going to be using the, um, the targets, the demographic targets for the alternate pool. So this is sort of a miniature panel um, that will, will give us an opportunity to select folks. Uh, you know, if, if folks drop, drop out, uh, we'll have the ability to select folks that match fairly close, hopefully, to the demographics of the folks that were selected. It's not, never perfect. Um, so the demographics that are going to be released online now, the 30 who are selected, that may change slightly if folks drop out and we have to replace them with alternates. But the reason for selecting as many as 10 alternates, um, and we pay them 50 bucks for their time as well, because they'll be attending that first session, is so we have the ability to, to hopefully match as close as possible. All right. So here I'm going to select the alternate categories this time. That is the, the targets for, there's still, still seven categories. And we're going to look at, oh, I have to go into my downloads folder get the, the remaining one that we just downloaded. And we're selecting 10 alternates there. Um, and here we go, running the alternates. And it did it on the first try once again. So there it is. Let's look at that, uh, at that group and make sure that there aren't any duplicates um, either with, within that group or with the panel that we've just selected in terms of folks who live at the same household. All right, so I'm going to download here and pull that up. And um, we also pull up here the selected panelists that we just selected so we can compare numbers there and just make sure that um, we didn't, uh, didn't select anybody as an alternate who has a, a, a household member who is also on the panel. So, we're comparing, we only have three folks that, uh, that where there are multiple in a single household. It looks like they're all different in terms of the alternate pool here. Um, that's this, that's the one in the small window is the alternates. I guess that's obvious because there's only 10 of them. And let's see, did the, any of those three numbers match up with any of the hyphenated numbers over here in the main panel is what we're looking for here. And I think we're good. I'm not seeing any duplicates there. I'm assuming you're going to double check all that, though. Yes, we'll double check this after the fact. And, and, um, but yes, uh, um, I'm not seeing any, anything right now. I think, I think I'm comparing it well enough here. Six, six, nine, two, five, two. I think we're, I think we're good. I think we're good there. But of course, yeah, we'll double check that afterwards. Um, OK, so. Um, that is, that is the selection. There's the panel. There's the alternates. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. <laughs> and Terry, I wanted you to, uh, to... Thank you so much to people, uh, watching who tried to watch on Friday. This went... Perfectly, and, and we had like, like every imaginable um, technical difficulty on Friday. It was such a letdown. So, so I'm so thankful, thankful that, that it went so smoothly today. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm so pleased. <laughs> so, so nice when everything works. Um, and I'm glad we did this again. Um, it'll be online saved. If you're watching live, this isn't the only time you can see it. If you want to go back and see the whole thing again, um, it'll be recorded. Uh, one more thing before I let you go, Terry. Um, what other ways can people be in touch or engaged with the project um, or sort of keep track of what's happening with the project? Sure. Well, the best way is probably our website. So you can just look for our middle housing, Eugene. Um, we have a, a very comprehensive website. It's got a couple of really good fact sheets on it, a way to sign up for our interested parties email list. We send out updates and newsletters and list upcoming events on that page. So that's really the best way. Plus our Engage Eugene page, which is linked to off of the website. And it's more of an interactive um, public engagement platform. Fantastic. And we'll have those links are the link to the main middle housing page on the city's website is linked to from our project website, which is just healthydemocracy.org slash Eugene. And um, oh, there's our main website on, 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 on the screen now. So healthydemocracy.org. And we'll have that linked from the front page pretty soon as well, now that we've launched the project officially. So Terry, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for doing this again on a Sunday and look forward to seeing you again soon. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thanks. All right, we're almost finished here, but I have a few housekeeping things for all the folks who responded to the invitation. First of all, thank you. And that has three exclamation points behind it. If you were selected, congratulations. Be on the lookout for an email from our operations manager, Kelly Coates, taking you through the next steps. That should be arriving in your inbox right away uh, today. If you weren't selected, you'll be notified by tomorrow. And just a quick word on that, please know that if you weren't selected today, as we've, I think, already made clear, that has absolutely nothing to do with you being qualified or not. If you're a resident of Eugene, you're qualified to participate. Um, your voice matters. And we appreciate you and the time that you took to respond and ask us questions, as I said. It's essential to the process. So again, thank you so much for responding, and we hope to see you in the next panel. Finally, if you're interested in knowing more about the process we're going through, this is only the first of seven more shows like this that I'll be hosting um, that we're going to produce. And each episode will feature an in-depth look at a different aspect of the process, and we'll take you through it step by step. We're calling these Discussions on Democracy. And it'll be available right here on the Huge Planning Facebook page and on our website and on the project website at healthydemocracy.org slash Eugene. Thank you to everyone who responded to the invitation. Thank you to Mayor Venice, Terry Harding, and of course to everyone watching. I'm Lynn Davis, Program Manager for Healthy Democracy. See you, see you next time. <laughs>